I'll, uh, well, I know I, I like to be a good steward of time, but um, when candidates are on the campaign trail, they go from one event to the other. So if you could bear with me for another 10, 15 minutes, we're gonna bring up Jim Abler, who just arrived, um, and I'll introduce him back again. Uh, go back one more slide. So the topic tonight for the U.S. Senate candidates is cronyism, and, and I really loved your comment. Let's just knock out capitalism, and it, it came from the fact that everyone was blaming in the media capitalism for the, uh, the reason the housing market crashed. It really wasn't capitalism, it's actually cronyism. So what is cronyism? It's an economic system where success in business depends on close relationships between big business and government. So we have our second candidate now, you heard from Monty Moreno, our second candidate is actually representing the state of Minnesota. His name is Jim Abler. Without further ado, Jim Abler. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's a good night to be here. Nice to have a good crowd like this on a cool night. And, uh, okay. I love your magazine. I love this so much I bought stock in it. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> on page 18, you see a picture looks a lot like me. And my mom likes this picture, so uh, on behalf of my mom. And uh, I think you'll find that to be uh, valuable. And so, uh, first afternoon, we'll talk about cronyism in a second, but I'll tell you somebody who's, doesn't, who's sick and tired of that cronyism stuff. This is my granddaughter, Raina. She was born on New Year's Eve last, or New Year's uh, Day last year, and provoked me to uh, run. You look in those eyes, and uh, I just saw her last week, and she kept saying this to me. Well, where was Al? All the problems going on, you know, all the deals he's doing. Uh, she was born in a tremendous debt, and she's lost liberty and freedom she never even knew she had. And that compels me. And this cronyism is just one of many things that should just just uh, tie your head into a knot and wonder what happened. America, was, America wasn't founded on cronyism, it was founded on, on freedom. And people came with a, with a dream. And 300 years ago when my first ancestors came before they fought in the Revolutionary War, uh, they didn't come to get a good business deal and have somebody help them out and give them something for free. They came and they uh, hard fought their way through uh, a lot of trouble and they believed in what this place was becoming. A hundred years ago, my Irish ancestors came uh, with a dream, the Dailies, and they came with a dream to escape trouble and have a chance to excel. And if you want to have a country excel and be exceptional, you don't do stuff like this. American exceptionalism is not because somebody got good deals for their buddies, and they gave them sweetheart Solyndra projects, and they said, yeah, we can get you squared away. And it wasn't so that they could get good pensions in the Senate. Some of the pensions in the Senate are bigger than the lifetime income of my, my constituents. I mean, really? When you get to write your own laws and write your own paychecks, it's like, really? That'd be the ultimate in cronyism. And that's when the inmates run the asylum. But so those relatives of mine, looked forward to what, they saw what it could be. Um, America's exceptional because, well, you're all exceptional, that's me, Andrew. Actually, you're all wonderful people. The, China is not an exceptional country. When a Chinese person comes here, they become exceptional, just as you are. They have a chance to dream and to grow and to be everything they could be, that, they're, that, the, that the dreamers who came here in 1607 to have religious freedom, half of them died, by the way, just, and they had a terrible boy over what they thought this place could be. And so what provokes me uh, to run is to help preserve that. Immigrants come now. The immigrants, I've, talking to, I've been to 175 places in my campaign, which has been awesome. I've, gotten, I've been to every corner of the state, every Senate district, and people that I run into aren't looking for a handout or a deal from the government. They just want to be left alone. And if you want to find a way to spend more money you don't have, do a lot of cronyism. Do some no bid contracts, set up a deal with, uh, with your pal, and don't care what stuff costs. And don't care about the outcome. The whole health exchange, the whole federal one and even the state one is, is an example of how not to do it. And just so you know, cronyism, uh, I was just talking to a guy who works for the Patriot. Um, and he said, you know all those ads they're doing for Mincher? 
None of them are going to Cape Talk or the Patriot. Or those, they're all going to the other ones. Like, really? <laughs> I mean, it's in our backyard. So, we're spending, uh, let me teach you holidays. You, we just had Thanksgiving and now we've got Christmas coming. Uh, the 25th of September is deficit day. That's when we run out of money that they've extracted from you from hook and by hook. <laughs> $2.7 trillion they spent. And they're still a trillion dollars late, so they're borrowing $10 billion a day to buy whatever rubbish and no-bid, crony, bad contracts that they've invested in. And when I, I, I was the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee in 2011 and 12, and we had to cut our budget. We cut spending $3.8 billion over four years, the largest spending cut in the history of Minnesota. And we did that by finding ways to economize and, and ignoring who was the vendor and doing the right thing. The stuff I couldn't cut was federal grants. That were, the stupidest things we do in Minnesota in the healthcare side is federal grants. Do you realize there's a grant that they study the water quality in Duluth at the beach? Now, did you ever go to Duluth at the beach? How long did you spend on the water? About 20 seconds. No germ is going to get you in 20 seconds, I promise. And I said, let's quit doing that. Oh, no. That's a federal grant. You can't touch that. So we had to do some other reductions and manage better. And so let me tell you what the answer to American exceptionalism is going forward. It's, it's American qualityism. And it's uh, where you get people that actually know what to do. When I was, it was the hardest thing I've ever done and the coolest thing I've ever done to run that budget. And I had three or four hundred meetings in my office with people who look a lot like you. They run a, they run a, a group home, they have a nursing home they run, or they're a relative of somebody. Uh, a, a client of one of the healthcare programs we have, and we're very generous in Minnesota. Actually, no, you are very generous in Minnesota. So thank you for your generosity. <laughs> I'll tell you a number later just to make you feel bad. Um, but so those three or four hundred meetings I had, and I had like 17 one day, so, and, and people would say, why don't we do this? And I said, I don't know, why don't we do that? So by March, I accumulated so many new ideas about how to do it. We were saving a ton of money just by improving the quality. My assistant, my administrator said, you have to stop writing new language. They've never written so much new language as they've done under you. We're out of time, that's all you get to get done this session. Which was kind of sweet, and so we cut spending $3.8 billion. Which, by the way, is a lot. If you nationalize it, it's worth a half a trillion dollars over 10 years. And money that, and nobody came to harm. If you watched the election in 2012, besides the debacle, the bad news of it, not one person talked about the healthcare problems and the big cuts that Abel did didn't come up. We did it nice. We did it with humanity. We did it with focusing on quality. Not in the, I told the vendors. I said, I'm not here to protect vendors. I'm here to protect the client we decided to serve. And whatever, whatever you all think, nobody in this room wants to turn a senior out of a nursing home or have a disabled guy sit by a street. And neither do I. So we found ways to do it better and give them more independence. And so we did not in cronyism. We did, let's make it work. And the people who survive, the vendors who do what I want, to serve the plants that I care so much about, that you care so much about, they could be relevant. That's who we hired. That's how their system we designed and it worked. So that was the success of our time. Now this is the bad news part. How not to do it? The average increase in the healthcare budget, all funds, state and federal, uh, for the two bienniums before I got there, was about $3 billion a biennium. By the way, that's a lot. And the rate of growth was in the 20s, something like that. And so we got there and our rate of growth was a billion. The rate of growth was like 4%. Still went up, but it was the lowest reduction, the lowest growth ever. So now we have, do you know elections matter? So as you hear there's a Democrat governor and there's a Democrat House, Democrat Senate. The all fund spending, remember, three, three, one. This biennium is four and a half billion, all funds. Like four and a half times the growth of me. And then it's five billion. Like your head just wants to explode. And the quality isn't any better. They just spent money like they were crazy. A lot of that's free federal money. By the way, the free federal money is, by, is owned by somebody, borrowed by somebody. Um, you know who our big debtors are? Our creditors, excuse me? The Chinese, Japanese, oil producing countries. Like our best friends. I mean, not so much. All right. So, how do we handle these kinds of matters? We do it with quality. We say, how about if we care about that we spend the money carefully? What if we think that the $17 trillion is going to be owed to people like Raina and your grandkids and, and the progeny of her? 
She wants the American dream too. There's be nothing left for her. That's why I'm running. So um, I would love to chat with any of you that want. Um, you are just one thing about the, the Tea Party in particular. I was so offended at Harry Reid being called you guys anarchists. Like, yeah, really. Just where's the where's the, like? <laughs> have you met any of those people? And I made the joke about exceptionalism. This is a true thing. You are the most studied, well-read, engaged in fact group of people active in the political spectrum today. You actually care about facts and data and reading stuff. You read. You actually listen. You listen to lecturers on topics and you take notes. Yeah. So at some point, the country belongs to us. And that's why I'm running. Because I want to make a difference. I know how to manage their spending. And the biggest domestic threat we have, and there's a lot of them, is this out of control spending. It is going to eat our lunch. And I know how to do it. I'm the only candidate who's cut billions and knows how to cut a trillion. I'm the only candidate who knows how to fix Obamacare. And when it collapses, then it seems like it's gonna. I, I, I'm the, I didn't get into that very far, but um, that's what I do. I'm a chiropractor by trade. I've been in every health reform effort. And I tried to fix it, and it's, they were like, it was awful. So, um, but I want to thank you for your engagement. You know, thanks to Jack and for putting me in the magazine. And the picture my mom's so proud of that I say it's on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but keep it up. Tell your friends. One last thing, then I'll stop. Um, 175 places I've been. Do you know what your neighbors across the state want? They want us to quit fighting and solve problems. Oh, yeah. That's it. And you probably agree. However, they don't care how we do it. You actually know it might make a difference. So talk to your neighbors and your people you run into about some of the things you're learning here about how to do it better based upon quality and that's going to last a long time and it's honest and it's based on morality and it's based upon freedom and truth and all those things in life and all those things that are so important to us so they're like oh yeah that sounds good we could do that too so help them then they're going to vote with you and we're going to get our state back we're going to get our country back and the rain is and then your Debbies and Toms and Dorothys, you're going to a country that they're so proud of. And they'll say, thanks, Grandma. Thanks, Grandpa, for doing all that stuff. So or my website is jimmyabler.com. Love you on our team. I'm going everywhere. If you've got a meeting somewhere, I'd be happy to go and chat. I can, whatever time frame you allow. And uh, so thank you very much. Good questions, Jim. Oh. You know, we're all so offended when Harry Reid says something bad about us. I know it's very tough for us to sleep at night. All right, three questions. I think we'll, we could be finished by 9 o'clock. It's 10 minutes away, so we'll try to keep it to about three. Uh, we'll go with you first. Um, you said you, you cut all this, this money out of the budget. Why did you think it was necessary to uh, vote on the stadium bill then and spend the money you just saved? All right, well, we can go there. Um, the, the, the questions best suited to me are national ones, but I'll, uh, I'll talk about that. And briefly, there's a, uh, I thought they would leave. I really thought they would leave. The good people disagree, I thought they were gonna go. There's a, no, I'm just telling you. And so, if they go, we lose 20 some million dollars in revenues that come, uh, when A-Rod or whoever comes here, he pays taxes to Minnesota. The related industries to that are in the 20 million range, mid 20s that we get as a state. Our biggest exposure is about 35. Um, they are paying all the utilities, they're paying all the maintenance, and we have a venue that's good for 355 days a year when football's not there. And it's the only venue of its type between Hudson Bay, uh, uh, Kansas City, um, Denver, and Milwaukee. And we can have Billy Graham things there and all that. And so a lot of people don't agree with that. The one thing I'll just do this as a chance to say, I'll never lie to you. I'll answer any question, I'll face any crowd, I'll tell you why I thought it was a good idea. Good people didn't agree. Uh, they thought the pull tabs would work, obviously they're not working. But um, there's a thing called fiscal notes where the, where the Republican appointee, uh, Commissioner Showalter, and his group did their best research, they said they're going to generate money. So it wouldn't be general fund, which was my criteria. And they were flat out wrong. But we, we govern by fiscal notes, by what we think things will cost. And so that's just the true answer. Okay, show of hands, any other questions? We've got probably about six minutes or so. We've got one up front. Jack, Jack, you got a lot of voice. You don't have a mic. Uh, 
Jim, going to the national platform is a whole nother, uh, whole nother situation. Uh, funding is, uh, is very important for you to be funded properly. Uh, but also staying in contact with your constituents here is very important. Uh, many times when people pick up, uh, and you've been in Anoka with us for, I don't know how many years, a long time. Uh, when you pick up and go to Washington, people have a tendency to disconnect from where they're from. Uh, and, and I want you to address that a little bit, but why or what safeguards you from falling into the trap of K Street's million dollar promises, um, the threats by unions, uh, the threats by um, angry uh, seniors in the same party. H how are you gonna stand and hold a purity to the Constitution? And that's what we look for, Jim, as you know. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm not sure we think about it. My favorite president was Ronald Reagan. He got in my head the Constitution was like something like the foundation of everything. And I learned that as a younger person and I still believe it and I, I carry that, I even quote him. I believe him when he said, we the people are free. So that's my rounding on that. Um, good people don't always agree. If you want someone who thinks just like you, then look in the mirror and you'll be perfect. <laughs> but so if anybody knows me at all, in 15 years, I have been independent in my approach. That independent has aggravated some people sometimes, but they know that I stand for what I believe. My criteria decided what I'm gonna do is creator, conscience, and constituent. And when I put caucus on the bottom of the list, President Swiggin was very angry at me. Um, but that's why I didn't run to be a partisan. I don't like politics at all. Um, you will, uh, I am very strong in my convictions. Uh, I'm taking money from Main Street. If I'm owned by anybody, I want to be owned by you. I want to be owned by the Tea Party, I want to be owned by the Liberty people. I want to be owned by, by Main Street up in Vaudette, where I actually my grandparents, great great grandparents homesteaded it on when I was up there. And, and so that's who I want to own me. Somebody owns everybody. I want my wife to own me. I want my neighbors so I understand to own me. I want regular people to think they have a guy who's normal. And there's 5.3 million people in Minnesota, so I probably won't return the call right away. But the more I talk to representative people, the more I understand. And my 175 stops have helped me learn a lot about Minnesota I didn't know. And it's in my head. And that compels me. And so the best I can tell you is, I don't think I'm gonna. Um, I was in Washington once in my life, just so you know. I went there as a charter, we founded the charter school in 94, went there about that. And they say you should go visit there, it's like, do I have to go visit to talk to these people? I don't want to be owned by those guys. And so you need a consultant, like, I've got consultants, you know? We're going talking to the people. The people want somebody who looks after them, and so that's, that's who I listen to, that's who I'm owned by. As a chiropractor, I see people that come in, I learn about what's going on and the challenges you face. So that's in me. It's, so that's the best I can tell you. And I, if I'm not, throw some at me. One, one last question. Yeah. Raise your hand if you want. Right over here, this gentleman in the back. Why is your, why is your jacket saying Army and Navy? <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say Army? Uh, you said you know how to fix a round chair. How would you fix a round chair? Maybe it's um, yeah. <laughs> let me just give you the one minute summary of my background. And uh, I'm actually, there's a paper coming out soon uh, that I'll be writing about it. Uh, I'm the one, of all the candidates, I've had the most experience in the whole topic. I've served on the most conference committees on health care. I've been part of the, the reform and plenty did it in 2007 and before. I have a career in, a, a, in health care. I've helped every health care group in some way uh, for what they need. Orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists. I spent my whole time doing that. What, what the Obamacare thing was about was access. At any price, they wanted to get people into insurance. How's that working for you, by the way? But what they didn't take into account was cost and quality. And it turns out that those are gonna be getting worse even though the whole thing is a mess. And so, to summarize, Minnesota, the GDP for healthcare is about 12%. You know that? The national GDP for healthcare is 17.7. Maybe we should use some Minnesota ideas that would work. Like where you don't overcharge, where you have, uh, we do more uh, coordination of care. We do, um, the doctors actually have ethics and they don't waste care. We have the Mayo Clinic and the U to learn new innovations from. There's a lot of ways to do it. And 
I, I'm going to be putting on a list, but in, in the short, that's what you would do. And you're going to have to pick somebody to run for Senate. The guy there has no idea what to do about it. He, he's like so out to lunch. He's, he could have changed it. But the other individuals are great people. They're all great Americans. But their expertise is not in healthcare. And so they're going to have to like bone up on the topic. I've spent all these years running committees and being part of the task forces on how we do it. How to make Minnesota so lean. How to get that spending reduced in our healthcare part that I did. Part of that was about healthcare, about managing Medicaid. If you manage Medicaid, Medicare, how I manage Medicaid about focusing on outcomes and quality. You can save a ton of money and actually have better quality for less money. So that's the best thing. That's the short version. But I'll talk to you at length on the phone if you want. So maybe I'll give you my card. I'll walk around and hand out my cards and I'll get Great. it. Great. And so this is my real phone number. It rings in my pocket. Um, you guys are great. Check out our website, jimmyabler.com. I seek all your support. I promise I'll never lie to you. I promise I'll do my best. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you. I think Monty and Jim will stick around for a little bit if you guys have questions, right? Yeah. Monty, you'll be around too.